All right, guys, welcome back to part seven of my A86 respray series. And we're definitely getting toward the tail end here. We're uh, painting the little bits and pieces that I couldn't get in the booth in the first place. Obviously, just there, I was just painting the inside of the boot. One of the things I actually learned from painting the inside of that boot was I prepped the whole boot when I was all in primer. Obviously, in the last episode, I painted the outside of the boot with the rest of the panels. And I didn't mask the inside of the boot, not thinking that it was a big deal. And when I got the boot out of the booth and I was getting ready to paint the inside of the boot, I found a lot of the dry spray left a really rough texture on the inside. A lot of dry spray got on the inside of that boot and it was just like dust and like a rough texture. So I learned a valuable lesson there. And it's uh, if I'm going to paint something like a boot or a bonnet or something, and I'm going to do one side at a time from now on, mask the side that you're not painting because it's going to save you a lot of trouble or the other option would be to just prep one side without worrying about the opposite and don't mask it and then you can go ahead and prep the other side but yeah I think the best way for me is prep the whole lot and mask the side that you're not painting so I uh, learned that valuable lesson with the boot I had to you know go through the prep work again on the bottom but smashed it out there and uh, then I moved on to the bonnet so got the bonnet here in the spray booth I think I was working in the spray booth it may have been raining or something along those lines it does get really hot in the spray booth on a hot day it's definitely wasn't a hot day because it would have been much better outside with a breeze and a shade cloth but the same routine I just got the guide coat out spread it all over the panel and as you can see there the guide coat does work with uh, wet sanding you'd think that or in your head you'd think that the guide coat would just wash off with any kind of water or wet sandpaper but does work quite well and uh, that was something that I ended up doing with most of the car or something I never actually mentioned was like normally I would I prefer to dry sand everything just because of my situation I was kind of working in the dirt for most of the time being summer out here in Australia there, there was no grass or anything so if I did start wet sanding the car or any other panels I'd find myself walking around in mud pretty quickly. So I just dry sanded the car for the majority of the prep stage. And I found that if you finish with dry sanding and it comes time to mask the car up and use wax and grease remover to clean the parts, I found that it takes a ridiculous amount of time to really clean the panels with a paper towel and wax and grease remover. One of the little hacks that I found was if I dry sand the whole car and finish the last stage of the sanding with a wet sanding method, when it comes time to wax and grease remove the car, every time I wipe the car down, the paper towel comes out clean. So it's a quick and easy thing to do as like your last step before you go ahead and paint the car. And it just means that that surface is going to be a lot cleaner. The water carries away any of that sanding dust that doesn't get stuck in the sanding scratches and it just cleans it up really nice, ready to paint. So that's something that I do like to do and I haven't mentioned yet or really shown in the videos, but yeah, so got the bonnet all prepped up and ready to go and whacked it in the booth. And what I did was I splashed some water on the ground this time. I didn't do that during the other respray. And one of the things that I did notice was, especially when you're doing a lot of painting in one go, the dry spray does dry in the air and then just settles to the ground like dust. So at the end of each day where I was painting the car or painting the panels, I did find that I was walking around the booth and it was almost like there was just dust all through the floor of the booth. And the next day I'd have to come back and sweep it out. What I decided to do this time was just to splash some water on the booth. And it's probably something that I should have done during the respray. It probably would have helped keep the debris down. This is an afterthought that once again, like I said, constantly learning here. And that's just something that I'm going to take away for my next respray. If uh, the spray booth that I'm in is permitting i'm gonna definitely wet down the floors just get a bucket of water like i said i i did learn a lesson when i did the boot it was make sure you mask the opposite side to that you're painting so as you can see here the bonnet is completely masked on the other side and i'm just painting the inside first here going through with a bit of base coat and uh, getting nice coverage and one of the other things here is i've got the car in the booth and there's like a little panel at the rear of the car that for some reason i just never painted it probably had something to do with the fact that i was rushing when i was masking and it would have just been easier for me to come up and over that section but once the whole car was sprayed and i started hanging panels on there and i thought wow the car looks perfect i couldn't live with myself if i didn't paint that little last little section of the car because that was the last thing that i didn't paint and uh i think part of the thought process was it's going to be behind the bumper no one's even going to see it but i just couldn't live with myself if I didn't go ahead and paint it plus I was already mixing paint and I had the guns dirty anyway so it wasn't a big deal just to throw a sheet over the car mask that little section up and then just turn that little bit white as well just so the entire car's painted 
So another thing that I wanted to mention about this bonnet was I did paint this bonnet back in the day when I did the engine bay. It was around about the same time when I did the engine bay is when I painted this bonnet. Uh, it ended up I ended up buying this bonnet secondhand and it came to me as a yellow bonnet, which is pretty unusual, but I did paint it already. And the reason I'm repainting it now again is, well, for one, it's going to match the car a lot better. Painting it all at the same time in the same place, it's going to look a lot nicer, even though it didn't look bad. But there was a couple of repairs that I had to do on the inside of this bonnet. And I'm not sure if you noticed, but there was like a couple of gray primer marks on the inside of the skeleton here of this bonnet. And one was right in the center and the other one was off to the side a little bit. And that's a little story where the one in the center was just the strut brace was hitting the bonnet. Uh, obviously the car flexes a lot and under cornering it must have moved and just damaged the paint on the bonnet. So all I did was bash that back in just to give it a bit of clearance. And then the other repair was something that took me a very long time to work out. So I was running a small port 16 valve for AGE and I was running the front wheel drive intake manifold, but it was a cut and shut manifold. So the front wheel drive manifold sits a lot higher than the genuine rear wheel drive ones. So what was happening was whenever I would really floor it anywhere, if I really rev the car out, I found that my throttle would get stuck and I didn't know why. I ended up spending countless hours just pulling my throttle apart, checking my throttle cable, trying to work out what was getting stuck. I thought maybe the carpet. I thought that maybe it could have been the floor mat, but it was just doing my head in. I didn't know why my throttle would get stuck sometimes. And as soon as I put the clutch in, like what would happen was I'd floor it and then when I want to lift, the car would keep going and then I'd panic and then I'd put the clutch in and then it would stop. And it took me so long to realize that because of that front wheel drive manifold sits so much higher, the linkage would get caught up on the frame of the bonnet and it would just hold the throttle open. So when I was going flat out, it would hold the throttle open for me and it was pretty terrifying. So uh, it took me a very long time, probably took me too long to work out that it, that's what it was. So during this process, I did clearance the throttle body as well. And that's why I decided to just respray the whole thing, make the whole thing look nice, just like the whole car. And um, since I did that, I've never had a problem. And in the future, I ended up doing single throttle bodies with a 7A. So all these little issues went away. So that does seem like a pretty unique problem. Uh, it's not really something that I hear a lot of people talk about. So if that's something that's ever happened to you, let me know in the comments. And uh, or if you know that, or if you know of someone that's happened to, let me know in the comments because I'd really like to hear from you. All right, so now it's time to move on to the clear coat. And what you see me doing here is I've just pulled out my new little minigun, which is a DeVilbis SRI ProLight. It's obviously the minigun version of my other guns, which are a GTI ProLight. I don't know if it was the best idea to try and paint the underside of a body with a minigun, but I did just buy that gun and it was like my latest toy. So I definitely just wanted to use it. So it didn't really harm the paint job. It just took longer to paint the underside of the body. It was a bit more intricate working my way through. But yeah, I think that using a full size gun would have been the way to go in the future. But uh, it was just like, you know, the feeling when you buy a new toy, you kind of want to use it straight away. And this was the perfect opportunity. So I did use the mini gun for the inside of the bonnet just because like I was just super excited about getting a new gun. And one of the great things about the mini gun was you use a lot less paint. It doesn't waste as much paint. So when I use my full size guns, as you've probably seen in the other videos, the whole spray booth becomes like really dusty. It's just overspray going everywhere. And in order to get a good finish, you want to turn up your pressure, obviously within reason. And then the more pressure that you run on the gun, the flatter the finish you're going to get on the panel. But the trade off is you're going to use more paint because less paint actually gets on the panel and more just goes flying up into the air. So. Uh, that's something that you've got to sort of work with with the full size gun and I found that with my mini gun it does use a lot less product so I don't have to compromise as much as I would if I was using a full size gun and be wasting heaps of product so I guess that one of the benefits of having a mini gun would be if you did have a limited supply of whatever paint you were spraying I would probably reach for the mini gun if it was possible to do so if there wasn't like a really large flat surface to paint and the chances are that I'd probably be a lot more likely to get through the paint job without running out of paint. That wasn't the case here obviously I had plenty of paint left over this is just the new toy that I wanted to use but um, the mini guns definitely have their place they definitely save a lot of product and uh, I don't think I've ever had a bad paint job spraying with my mini gun it's just because it uses a lot less product it's a lot more difficult to mess up so I highly rate this gun I know a lot of people think that you know mini guns are a waste of money but this is definitely for me 
me something that, you know, now that I've got one, I don't think I could live without it. So while we're on the subject of spray guns, I figured I'd talk to you guys a little bit about the guns that I used on this spray job. So I did give you guys a quick overview of like my gun settings and I did talk a little bit about the actual gun itself. So obviously this gun being the SRI ProLite, the main guns that I use are all GTI ProLites by the Vilbis. But um, if you do go out to a paint store or even if you just jump online and you're looking to buy one of these Devilbis guns, you probably will get overwhelmed with all the different options that you can choose from. So depending on your compressor setup, how much air you have to use, uh, depending on the type of paint you're spraying, there's all sorts of different air caps and fluid tips that you can buy. So the first Devilbis gun that I bought was my clear gun, which is the gold one that I'd sprayed the body and the panels with. And it is a GTI Pro Light, and it's running a TE10 air cap. Now the TE10 air cap is their LVLP option for an air cap. So that would suit a DIYer best if you haven't got like a huge compressor. This gun will use less air. So someone like myself, running just a compressor here at home. I have mentioned it here before that this compressor that I use is a 3.5 horsepower compressor with a 110 liter tank and it runs my guns beautifully. Uh, so that was the first gun that I bought. So all of my pro light guns, the full size guns run a 1.3 millimeter fluid tip and the only one that doesn't is my PRI pro light. So that's my primer gun, which is the exact same body as the clear gun. So it's a full size gun and it's a GTI Pro Light body. It's one that I bought second hand and then I went ahead and bought a fluid tip and an air cap for it to suit the PRI Pro Light. So the PRI Pro Light is a gun that you can buy just for primer. It's a primer gun and it's just a thicker fluid tip and an air cap to suit it. So I'm running the PRI setup in just a normal GTI Pro Light gun just because that was the cheapest way that I could figure out how to do it. So my PRI setup is running a PR10 air cap and then my fluid tip is a two millimeter fluid tip and obviously when you do that you buy the kit and you have to get the fluid needle to suit so that's my main primer gun so when i bought the second hand gti pro light to set up as a primer gun it actually came as a kit the guy was selling two guns in a box they had like a it was like a limited edition de beer spray gun it sort of caught my attention the blue ones that i have and uh, they're just matching guns and then the guy sold me the original fluid tips that he had and air caps. So the one that I actually use is the TE20 fluid tip. And that just runs a 1.3 millimeter air cap as well. So those are my main guns that I would use for primer, base coat and clear coat on any big job like this full respray. And then obviously this mini gun that I bought here was the SRI Pro Light, and that uses a 0.8 millimeter fluid tip. And the air cap that came with my SRI Pro Light is a TE5 air cap. And that's just a high efficiency air cap. That's much the same as the TE10 that came on my clear gun. So the clear gun I paid full price, plus this um, SRI mini gun I obviously paid full price for. And then my base coat and primer gun I just bought secondhand. I uh, got a really good deal for them. And um, that's just what I use. That's I really do recommend buying good quality guns, even if you don't buy the Vilbis guns. Like it doesn't bother me what you buy. I just found that these are the ones that I liked and I when I bought the first one it was incredible how much better my painting was just how much better the finishes were and I obviously make a lot of mistakes as I'm going especially watching these videos over my techniques not perfect uh, it's very difficult to spray paint so it's something that when you watch a professional do it you think wow that looks easy <laughs> it's definitely not it takes a lot of practice there's different skills involved uh, it's just the rabbit hole that you have to go down simple things like spraying really large panels and just trying to maintain a consistent distance from you of your gun from the panel is really difficult uh, it's one of those things that you don't realize how difficult it is until you try and then whenever I do watch professional spray painters on YouTube just how perfectly they apply the paint and how evenly they do it it's just incredible it's obviously something that they do day in day out as a full-time job but for someone like myself is just having a go watching someone that really has the skills down pat is pretty impressive so this is something that like for someone like me that does make mistakes constantly uh, the guns really do cover that up and the finish that I do get in the end ends up being like a really really nice finish and at the end of the day the way I look at it is the end result is all you're looking for and if you can get a really good finish regardless of how you get there or what kind of spray booth or paint you're using if you've got a good finish that's going to go the distance and it's going to last I think 
that, you know, you're onto a winner. So that's kind of the mentality that I've taken through this whole paint job. And I don't think paying someone to do this job for me would have been nearly as satisfying as what it was to actually do everything myself and then stand back and just take a look at my own handiwork. Yeah, I, like, I, like I always say, if anyone out there wants to have a go at something like this, obviously start small, but then work your way up. And if you're willing to put the effort in, it definitely pays off. I highly recommend having a go at something like this if you're even thinking about it. So... So now that the bottom half of the bonnet's finished, uh, it's time to move on to the top. And what you see me doing here is like another little tip here for you guys is just got a, just like a spray bottle of wax and grease remover and just spraying the whole thing down just to get a nice clear finish or like a nice shiny finish. And this is just like the last time that you can check to see if there's any imperfections right before you actually commit to spraying the bonnet or whatever panel you're spraying. So if you're new to painting and bodywork, uh, something that you might not know is you can prep a panel to you to the point where you think it's absolutely perfect and then you can spray a coat of clear on top and then all of a sudden that clear is gonna highlight a whole heap of imperfections that you just could not see before there was a shine to the panel. This is the reason why I use the wax and grease remover in this way. I did this with the whole car. So I'd spray the whole thing down and then take a minute while the whole thing was glossy to just really take a look in the light, let the, the light on the roof, like move my head around so the light on the roof could move across the panel and see if I could find any ripples, dents, scratches, anything that wasn't quite right. Because this is the very last chance that you've got before you commit to actually spraying the bonnet or panel or whatever. This is actually one of the last panels that I actually sprayed in this whole respray series. Obviously, I've mentioned before that I did come back and do the bumpers, the matte black bumpers at a later date didn't actually film it but this is the very last panel that you're going to see me paint and after this we're going to start reassembly of the car at this point in time while i was actually spraying the bonnet i actually did already start assembling the car it was something that i'd done slowly over time and then all these little miscellaneous bits were getting done while the car was in the process of being put back together so the way i edited it was like i sprayed everything and then just started hanging panels all at once but with the setup that i had it was just easier and safer to just keep the panels on the car rather than having them kick around the shed or the house you know i could i could store panels in the booth but you know you just run a risk of things falling over you may you might knock something so i just found that the safest place for a lot of these panels that were freshly painted was on the car so this is going to be the last little bit of base coat that you guys will see going on the car and from here i'm going to switch to spraying the clear coat and when i sprayed the clear coat i did it slightly differently to the way i sprayed the rest of the car because this panel is flat i can get away with pumping a lot more product onto the panel the idea is if you've got a panel that's hanging vertically you got a much higher likelihood of getting runs whereas if it's flat i can spray down heaps more product and all it's going to do instead of running it's just going to self level this is something that I could have done on the roof of the car when I was spraying the body shell, but I didn't. I think it was just because I, was, I had a lot on my mind on that particular day. It was kind of like the big day, the big main event. So um, this is a technique that I have done in the past. This is how I did spray the bonnet the first time I sprayed it. And all I do is I just slow right down. And, you know, obviously the gun, gun settings are much the same and the pressure is quite high. So as I did mention earlier, you'll see the uh, overspray is just going all through the booth. It sprays up in the air. And that's what I was explaining that the uh, minigun doesn't really do that as much as these full-size guns. And um, you will actually see on the second coat of clear that I do here, there is like a secondary camera, like another perspective where you can see me spraying from the side and it's got more of like a open perspective. And you can see a lot more of the booth on that perspective and you will see just the sheer amount of dry spray that just goes everywhere. So that is just a really good little example of how when I was talking about with the minigun, not really getting too much overspray or wasting too much product. Um, when I did this, bonnet i did waste a lot of product and the idea was i just wanted to get the bonnet as flat as possible and through the second coat you can actually see if you look closely the paint is so thick because i'm moving so slowly that you can actually see the air pressure is actually creating ripples in the paint that's still wet so it's definitely super thick but yeah like i said the idea is that the paint sits there before it dries it has a chance to self level and you get a really nice flat finish on a big flat panel like this so that's the technique that i did on the bonnet here i could have done this on the roof i obviously didn't the roof did turn out out quite nice anyway but uh this is just what i'm doing here for the bonnet but just like the rest of the spray job when i did the panels the primer when i sprayed the body i did like to leave a little bit of raw footage in here so for the rest of the clear coat here i might just leave in some raw footage it won't be for too long but yeah like i say if you don't like the raw footage and you want to see me start to reassemble the car you can fast forward to minute 27 33 and that's where i start the reassembly
so now that the entire car is now painted, it's time to do the reassembly. So this little clip here, you can obviously see I only just finished painting the panels. I still got the doors and everything hanging up in the booth. This was the day after I painted the panels. So like I said earlier, best thing for me was to store the panels on the car. So they came straight off of the rack and off the, off the wires hanging from the ceiling and straight onto the car. So I'm actually making my first mistake here and that's putting the guards on before the doors. So I actually put both guards on and got them lined up with the headlight and the bonnet and spent some time getting everything nicely aligned. Then I went to put the door on and realized that I can't get to the door bolts without taking that guard off. So the way to do it is to start with your doors, line your doors up with the rear quarter panel, get all them fitting nice, and then you move on to installing the front guards. You spend some time getting the gap between the door and the front guard all nice. And that's when you move on to the bonnet and then the headlights. So obviously did it wrong and then had to pull it apart and do it again. You can actually see in this clip the damage at the bottom of the bonnet before I painted it. There's a couple of little marks there, that little one in the center. And then that one off to the left was from the throttle body. And this, like I said, was obviously before I painted the bonnet. And as you can see in this next clip, my clothes change. And that's just because it's a completely different day. It would have been a few weeks later where my dad was actually able to come and give me a hand with the doors. We actually put the rear boot on and I forgot to turn the camera on and we just both looked at each other and went, we're not taking that off again because it was um, definitely like a two man job, but you could have a third person. We were stressing about scratching any of this paint because it was quite fresh and everything did look really, really nice. So we really took our time, try to make everything line up and we're real careful not to damage anything. So once we got the boot on properly, we were like, it's not coming off. <laughs> we don't want to take the risk. So... Yeah, so my dad gave me a hand with the doors, the guards, the boot. And then after this, we would have removed the bonnet. And that's when I would have started the prep work on the bonnet. But um, I spent most of the time that I had at the farm by myself. So my dad only ever came periodically. So when he was there, I needed to take full advantage of him giving me a hand, lifting things and uh, just doing odd jobs here and there. But I had no problem walking around with the panel while I was off the car. There's no, no issue at all, but it just gets kind of sketchy when it comes time to actually mount things i've seen people mount doors with like a trolley jack holding it up and that but uh yeah it's just one of those things where i just wasn't willing to take the risk so yeah we've got the bumper on here uh for anyone that doesn't know this took me a little while to work out that the bolts for the bumper bar brackets are in the boot you've got a couple of grommets that you pull out and uh and you have to have like an extension socket running all the way into those holes to undo the bumper bar brackets then there's obviously a couple of bolts on the sides but that did actually take me a bit of time to work out when I did pull the car apart. And uh, yeah, so once the bumper was on, moved on to getting the rear tail lights in. And I was actually only putting the tail lights in temporarily. So the tail lights were in pretty rough condition. One of them was actually cracked. I just put them in the car just to seal the car up. So just in case it was to rain or something on the way home. But once I got home, I decided to pull them back out again and I wanted to really polish them up nice. So the one that was damaged, I ended up replacing and also polishing, but here's a little video of the, the before and after of what it looked like after I polished them up. So now that the car's back together, that brings us to the end of this respray series. So I thought I'd end this series with some of the photos that I took during this respray, and you guys can get a close look at some of my handiwork. And if you enjoy this kind of content and you'd like to see more of this car, definitely take the time to check out my channel as this car's progressed quite a lot since this respray. I also have plenty of content on my friends' cars, ranging from big turbo 4AGE builds to 4AGE powered Pikes Peak race cars. And I am planning on creating a lot more content in the future. So with that said, let me know what you guys think in the comments, and I hope to see you in another video. Thanks for watching, guys.